The Corvallis School Board meeting for January 13th, 2022 is called to order. If you're willing and able, please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oregon law allows public meetings to be held entirely online. In the interest of public health and safety for all community members, especially immunocompromised individuals and their families, the Corvallis School Board will continue to hold its meetings online. Public comments is available at some of our meetings. Information about how to hold, how to provide public comments is available on the Corvella School District website. Additionally, the board agenda and packets, as well as the link to the Corvella School District YouTube channel are available on the Corvella School Board page on the district website. Public meetings are live streamed on the district's website, uh, on the district's YouTube channel, and a recording is posted to the same channel, typically the day after the meeting. I am grateful that this technology makes it possible for more community members to view and or participate in school board meetings, given the flexibility provided by Oregon law. A roll call is taken, and tonight we have uh, Vice Chair Safiger McDonald and Chair Samir Adrobo in attendance in person at the board meeting uh, room, and also our board members, uh, Vince Adam, Co-Vice Chair Hui White Bear, Board Member Tina Baker, and Board Member Shana Tomini in attendance uh, via audio or audio video. Due to and we do have uh, Board Member Therese Jones, who is excused for tonight, or not in attendance because they are excused for tonight. Due to technology and connectivity limitations, some virtual participants attending may have their video off or for some times or at all times. Also, with no objection from the board, uh, please note that after further review, item XC, well, item 10C16, uh, board policy IL, first reading, uh, under consolidated information was pulled from the agenda this evening. After additional revision, it will be resubmitted to the board in a future meeting. With that, we will transition to the next point in the agenda. January is board's recognition month, and Ryan would like to be recognized for 10 minutes on this topic. Ryan? Good. Well, thank you all for the hard work that you do to um, support the public education of all of the youth at Corvallis. Um, as I was thinking about um, board recognition, there have been years in the past where we've had this room full of people um, to share um, books with the board. Um, last year, we had a piece that was played by one, uh, a recent graduate, or at that point still a student at um, Preston Valley High School, uh, Ronnie Junkins. And then tonight, um, we wanted to um, have the opportunity to again be thinking about ways to recognize your work. And so one of the things I did was I looked at um, I looked at what makes an effective board. And I did that be, um, because of the effectiveness of this of this group. And so what I found um, from the Center for Public Education is like eight bullets about what makes a strong board. And so here's here's the list. And the reason I'm going to read it is because I see alignment between each one of these things and the work that you all do as a uh, as a board working together um, in a really functional, successful way. And so the first one is that the board um, is committed to a vision of high expectations for student achievement in quality instruction and define clear goals towards that vision. And that's a process that we have uh, taken on, you've been a part of. We're talking about how to engage the community as we continue to move forward with that vision. So check off number one, you've got it. Number two, 
um, strong shared beliefs and values about what is possible for students and their ability to learn. Um, I often think about a, a story that's was shared about um, a, a board that set high expectations for all students in their district and uh, the outcomes of that. And again, I see that um, in the work that you do. Number three, accountability driven, spending less time on operational issues and more time focus on policies to improve student achievement. Well, tonight you have a, a thick stack of policies for review. Yeah. <laughs> that Melissa sent your way. And um, recognizing that you ha have found that balance between the role of the board um, as um, folks that adopt policy for all of us and help our schools to run and function well by finding that balance. That's hard to find. It's not, um, it's not something that just comes. It comes with practice and time. Um, effective school boards have a collaborative relationship with staff in the community, something that you continue to work to achieve and something that is uh, near and dear to all of your hearts, I know. Um, effective boards are data savvy. I don't have to go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know how you love data. Um, and I know that that's your, um, both the inquisitive part of you and also the, the, the part of you that I've really drilled into um, data, but for a, a purpose beyond just looking at data for data's sake, but to really understand how, how it impacts and how um, our practices influence our kids. Um, align and sustain, um, and sustain resources. So again, having that long-term vision for our community and for our schools. Effective school boards lead as a united team with the superintendent, each from their respective roles with strong collaboration and mutual trust. And I think from that one, the piece that stands out to me is the trust, the trust component um, that we have to have for one another um, as we do this important work. And then effective school boards take part in team development and training. And um, I think that that's something that has been a hallmark of this board over time, that um, you have, this is year three doing training with OSBA, but even prior to that work that happened with Chalkboard. Um, so really ever since I've been on, a member of this team, it has been um, really a hallmark of, the, of your um, both your interest in learning um, and deeper knowledge, which I know uh, I know you all have, and also how that impacts and influences students. So um, again, you can check off all eight boxes um, for what makes an effective school board because you all uh, display that week in and week out, um, day in and day out for our kids. So again, I appreciate you and appreciate. Um, that we get January as an opportunity to recognize and highlight um, what's happening um, with our school board. The other thing I wanted to do is um, again continuing to think about art. So last time we had the um, we had music. This time we have student art that um, also I hope is something that you I'm, we're going to provide you. And I think that as you think about this space and how we continue to talk about student art in the spaces because it reminds us of the students that we serve. Um, we are, we're going to send each of you um, a piece of art from a middle school student at Lions Calling. Um, again, so that you are able to hang that somewhere as you think about this important work, especially in this time when we're um, not together, where we're separated. So um, Allison Donahue is the, an artist at Lions Calling, and this was a piece that um, they put together focused on squash. Um, so it was a little squash that they used for their modeling. And they also talked about um, the indigenous people and the ways that squash has been used over time. So again, I just felt like a, an appropriate piece for all of you. And again, Kim will make sure that you get these um, so you can hang them somewhere um, and think about the decisions that you make now and well into the future, the decisions you've made for our kids. So with that, um, I just wanna say thank you one more time. Um, Sammy asked me earlier what I had over here, um, and I, I told him that it wasn't his business at that time, but now, now he knows. So <laughs> again, thanks for all your work um, and really being a part of a highly effective, productive, intelligent, forward-thinking, collaborative group of people. So thank you again. Well, with that, uh, any questions or comments or statements from board members? Or anyone? See, none. Just want to thank you, Ryan, for really great uh, uh, statements about the board. Uh, it's a, oh, sorry. Yes, yes, uh, there is one. 
Uh, and I want to say it, it's it's a great honor to serve as a board that's functional, uh, functioning and caring and uh, prioritize the kids first. Yeah. It's, it's a rarity. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, it brings joy. It fills the cup. Uh, uh, my heart fills my heart, fills my cup, and I'm sure it does for my colleagues. Vince? I was just going to express <laughs> appreciation for um, the superintendent and for the staff, because I'll be quite honest, you make being on a school board easy. I mean, it's, and you know, when the board gets an idea for doing development, um, there's never any resistance. There's always enthusiasm and engagement with the board. And so, you know, we're both, we're two sides of a coin and, and you know, as part of the leadership team and it takes both sides to play. And so they're one of the reasons why this board is so effective is because Ryan, you've spent a lot of effort in cultivating us as, as a citizen board. And so thank you so much for engaging us and helping us grow and helping us work together. Absolutely. And I can't wait till, uh, till we meet again in next year in January and we're all together and we have students with us. So um, yes. to, um, this uh, to, be, to be seen, but we are moving in that direction. Special thanks to Allison for uh, the wonderful growing. Yeah. And this will be in a prominent place at uh, my house and uh, uh, hopefully office as well. Any other comments? I have a horrible painting behind me that's going to be, that's going to be replaced. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. With that, Shana has her. Uh, Shana, I'm sorry. It's okay. Thanks, Sammy. I just wanted to say, I, as one of the newer school board members or, or newest to be serving, how grateful I am to be serving alongside with the school administration, how you bring us along as trusted partners in this work. It is. It has just made this experience such a wonderful learning experience and a joy to be a part of. And I have so much gratitude for, for you, Ryan, for you. Melissa and for everybody else who's involved in the district leadership and also to all of my fellow school board members. I learn so much from each of you every week and have really appreciated you welcoming in, me into this space and being a part of that learning as well. So I have a lot of gratitude for each of you. And I also think student artwork is one of the greatest gifts that you could have given us this year too. So thank you for, for thinking of that and to the amazing artist for providing this gift that we'll be able to look at and have as a reminder to us of this work. Absolutely. And to Kim for helping to coordinate it as well. Thank you, Kim. Okay. It's thoroughly, uh, no more dysfunctional without the superintendent and uh, the secretary uh, your skills and ability to help us out is phenomenal. Uh, Kim has is always uh, there uh, behind the scenes helping us out and uh, do better and be better and support constituents and help constituents navigate through some difficult questions as well. So Kim, uh, the appreciation to the board is an appreciation to the good work that you do and the help that you help us uh, be in the best shape we can be. All right, any other comments? Seeing none, the board now will move into bond updates and we have uh, Kim, Pat we have, uh, Kim Patton and also uh, Dale Kendall. And, and uh, we have 30 minutes for our presentation and update. Sounds great. So Dale's going to take the lead tonight um, in providing information to the board. Um, Kim is with us as well, but she will be relying primarily on Dale um, and Olivia to um, share information related to where we are um, with our, our bond work. And Good evening. And Dale, on our side, we're in the process of pulling up the PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having for having us this evening. Um, it's been an exciting month or two as we got ready for opening of school at Bessie Coleman. And with the next few slides, we'll show some of that success. Um, slide. 
when I was putting this presentation together, I put out a call for, for great photos and, and Kelly Losey wins the prize by a long shot. These are all her photos of opening day and they're really fun. Uh, this shot in particular was awesome. Uh, and that shows the kindergarten preschool wing kind of looking down towards the, the uh, east. So you're looking at the kitchen area on the left and then there's classrooms on the right. So <clears throat> a very active classroom, fully decorated and underway. And that was awesome to see in, in such a short period of time. And on the right, you're looking at the main entry of the school with kids coming in uh, early that day. Going up the common stairway in nice single file way, that's awesome. And then, you know, organization in the gym to get kids ready to go where they need to go. And isn't that a beautiful gym? This is the uh, east entry of the school where kids um, that, are, that are come via bus will enter the building. And for now, most of the kids are gonna come in this way um, as parents are using the adjacent church parking lot to drop off uh, children. And then those, are, those children are escorted over by, by uh, teachers and administrators on into the building. So, it's, you know, another uh, kind of, a, I think they call it a train of some kind. And I'm, yeah, okay. So that was, that was Bessie Coleman and exciting times. Uh, more to come, that project um, will start to see demolition and site work this month. One of the things we um, done periodically throughout the program is kind of remind ourselves of the bond promises and to make sure that we, we believe we're keeping them. And, you know, as these designs progress and we've just finished up our last round of major designs, <clears throat> you know, the bond promises are always at our forefront. And we, we, you know, we run through the checklist diligently as we're completing designs. And we're proud to state that we're, make, we're making our goals and, and hitting all of those promises. Um, all of the projects, if, in, when you include Mountain View that we're gonna hopefully get approved this evening, <clears throat> will meet the bond promises for those facilities. Um, the Harding, and Col Harding College Hill project, we are doing an, a little bit more design refinement and we're gonna put it back out on the, um, for bids um, in, a, in about month, uh, two months. And with that, we, we hope, to <clears throat> hope to achieve our budget goals and we will still meet the bond promises for that, for that project. Um, this is the five, the final five. Um, you folks have approved the top four. And then, as I said, Harding College Hill, we hope to bring that to the board for approval in May um, and planning to start construction after school is out. <clears throat> we anticipate that project um, being less than a full year's work and so contractors will develop their own schedules um, with, our, with our approval. And so we might not see a lot of on-site activity right after school, except for emptying the building of, of um, contents. Um, but they will start in on their submittals and material procurement. And one of the benefits of having uh, a little bit longer time to build and, and not taking qu quite so long in construction is that we should be able to get our materials ordered um, in a timely manner so that we're not suffering delays like we are in some of our other projects. Uh, for example, rolling doors on multiple sites are not installed yet. Uh, ongoing projects, <clears throat> Bessie Coleman, I mentioned, you're gonna start to see a lot of activity there. And I, I will remind you that on the, the Bond webpage, there's a, there's a link to webcams. And you'll be able to, to see the Bessie Coleman uh, old school come down and the site work getting started uh, later this month. Catherine Jones Harrison, um, the new addition is underway. There's excavation and footing work happening, turning over some interior spaces um, real soon within the next few weeks. Um, the next one, terrific news, permit was received today for phase two. So that new addition will just be on the heels of Catherine Jones. And similarly, we're turning over some, some spaces here shortly. Uh, Lincoln, the covered play is almost ready to turn over. And if you've driven by lately, you'll see the big field has a nice uh, coating of mulch over it. And that's waiting for our return once things dry out a little bit. Um, both Corvallis High and Crescent Valley are having material delay issues. And so that's dragging out final completion. 
um, at Corvallis High, I, there's a picture coming up the showing the canopy that's pretty exciting. I think it's a neat, uh, very attractive uh, addition to the campus, and hopefully it'll encourage uh, students to, to pursue CTE uh, classes. That was one of its objectives. Um, so that's kind of it for those. Bond reserves. Um, Olivia, would you, are you on? Would you mind uh, kind of walking us through this? Sure, slide? no problem. Um, we, we wanted to highlight something that's included in the written narrative of the bond report tonight, but just making sure um, that we're being uh, extra transparent and clear about this. So um, there was a lot of change in a lot of the numbers on your update from um, last the last update in October to this update, which represents uh, through the end of November. Um, one of those changes had to do with our um, bond interest earnings. So as part of our final uh, wrap up work for our fiscal year end audit back in November, uh, we discovered that in prior years, um, when we did the adjusting year end entry to recognize the value of our investment portfolio on June 30th of each year, compared to the cost basis of that portfolio, uh, we were recognizing that fair market value as a gain on the investment and actually recording that as a revenue on June 30th. Um, and it, it sort of got collected um, and, and was considered like an actual revenue, but it's really just a mechanism that is done for year in financial reporting. And so we kind of went back and, and pulled all of those um, year in transactions out. So there were three of them. There was one at the end of 2018, 19, one at the end of 1920, and then obviously uh, the one at the um, end of 2021. So we had been sort of um, including some uh, resources in our overall uh, projections that were never gonna come to fruition. They were just there as a, as a valuation for presentation on our financial statements. So uh, a, new, a new learning um, <laughs> after a couple of years of, of not realizing that was going on. So uh, that was one of the major shifts in some of the numbers and then um, we did a real uh, sweeping overhaul of all of our projected costs. And so um, Dale is sharing some information on specific sites tonight, but uh, really did like a, a, a final sweep of all of those. And as he said, the, the one number that's still sort of um, squishy for us is the College Hill Harding site project. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Mm -hmm. Um, back to that slide for just a second. One more comment. <clears throat> the last paragraph talks about forecasts and the, and the new GMPs, guarantee maximum prices. So the four projects, including Mountain View, that you've that, that hopefully you'll approve, um, those, those reserve allocations that we had also impacted the unallocated reserve values. So there was a, besides the accounting transaction shifts, there was a, a lot of just pure construction cost shifts um, that affected that number. So some of that Delta we had already anticipated. Um, like we did for Lincoln and Garfield earlier this, or I guess in the fall, uh, we wanted to just kind of show you kind of where the, the Crescent Valley contract is. And we're close enough to being able to predict the end that we, we wanted to go ahead and do this. Um, on the, the left column, you're actually looking at um, quite a few different contract and contractors. The boiler athletics, um, the fiber, um, and then the building F project and the building A contract, all of those were different contracts that went into the overall college, um, Crescent Valley <clears throat> project budget. Um, and then I, I thought it was interesting to just do a quick calculation on the, the change order percentage. And I've said this in the past that, you know, I, th I think I've said up to 15% is not unexpected for remodel projects. So I was happy to see this one slightly below 10. Um, and then often it's interesting to look at what categories um, change orders fall into. And we captured the big ones here and, um, it, it, you know, and they're not atypical for, 
for this kind of project. So I was, uh, you know, it's always good to do these kind of analysis, <laughs> analyses. And then some nice pictures from Corvallis High. Not very many pictures, but I just love the way that walkway came in and it ties in so nicely to the campus. And then there's one of our two EV chargers. <laughs> um, the greenhouse, although those, those clear panels don't look very clear, that's because it's a very rainy day <laughs> when they were taken, but those are new. So that building got a restoration. Um, the panels, if you had seen that building, were popping out, some were missing, a lot were cracked. Um, so, so now this, this facility is ready for the instruction to start again, which is awesome. Um, happy to have that uh, bond promise completed. Um, I, we resurrected the slides from last month, um, recognizing some discussion last week um, at last week's board meeting. So we, we just wanted to make sure that the board understood kind of the scope of the work. So on the left side of that picture, there's a white cut and paste zone. And that basically reflects the concrete patio that's intended that comes off of the, the gym. And it's intended to provide some, dish, some, some additional space for the kids. And there's a fence around that yard. Um, and so that, that's a nice addition. Um, you can see a little driveway off of 18th Street there. It doesn't, it's hard to see in this picture, but there will be a, in a, a site improvement that's actually a, a trash enclosure. Right now there's dumpsters scattered around out there. So that'll look a lot more tidy and in compliance with city, city uh, code. Um, the science, what will become the science classrooms is the white, uh, the white um, object on the left side of the picture, kind of on the upper side near the parking lot. And the, the, Appearance from the sky isn't going to change very much, but there will be an improvement of the appearance of the outside of the building there in the form of some parapets. Right now, it looks like kind of a scabbed on addition. It'll look like it belongs um, after this, this project. Um, on the right side of the picture, there's a white, <laughs> more on this slide. On the white side, there's a white, on the right side, there's a white roof rectangle. And the intention there is a, a solar array. <clears throat> um, that's the key site elements from this view. And then on the next slide, you can see, um, basically it indicates uh, kind of the bond promises, if you will. We're doing a big bathroom restoration on the left and on the right, there'll be a finishes restoration of those, those restrooms. Um, library is gonna get an ADA ramp and upgraded finishes. Uh, you can see this, this, what will become the science lab, what are now uh, storage and locker areas, um, new kitchen floors. A key element here is that new front office. So it'll get quite a revamp to provide the secure entry vestibule that, that all of the schools are getting, um, as well as um, you know, more meeting spaces and, and, and private offices as needed, collaboration space. So. That is um, just a, a reminder of what the Franklin Project looks like. College Hill, just an update on where we're at with that project. Um, looking back a ways, um, be about a, about a year and a half now, we put the project on hold um, because there was a vision of upgrading the two-story portion seismically. And at the time, our budgeting um, indicated that that might be possible. So the, some very initial designs were put together, and, and the but we put it on hold because we wanted to see how the rest of the bond projects were going to see if we had the additional funds that were needed in order to pay for that seismic upgrade. So um, it turned out that, that it's not viable. So at this point, we are working through the design, um, ensuring that the bond promises will be met, that the scope will be reduced, to the, and the biggest change by far is to eliminate that, the work in that two-story portion. Um, we intend to, to have bids in April, and, and uh, as I said earlier, we're going to start construction on that this summer. So I think that was my last slide. Any questions? Okay. 
Here, I'm moving screens around real quick. Like, um, so, well, first, it's just really, it's disappointing to hear about the, that the budget isn't going to rattle out to allow us to do that work at College Hill. I know that we had gotten a lot of positive feedback from the community. I know I heard from folks in that neighborhood who were really excited to see us reoccupy students in that, in that space. So that is, that's really disappointing. But um, I think it really speaks to the integrity of, of this bond project that uh, this team is really committed to ensuring uh, that we're gonna meet those bond promises. Um, I wanna come back to the, uh, I guess this question is for Olivia, coming back to the, the discussion around reserves. And I just wanna ask the hard question, is that revision on our, on our reserves and that funding, is that going to affect our ability to fulfill our bond promises? No, we don't believe that will have an impact on our ability to achieve all of the bond promises that were laid out. Um, and as I said, with the exception of the College Hill Harding project, uh, we're you know, very confident uh, with those projects and those contracts at this point in time. So um, we know that we can meet the bond promises at the Harding site with the, the budget that we have remaining. It just requires some reworking. And I mean, that is, uh, indic you know, just indicative of how this project has been conducted, you know, and so no surprises there. And I'm sure that if there was a difficulty, you would bring it forward to us. So uh, thank you for that. And thank you for just how we're doing that, even though this is disappointing news. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from board members? I think I think the one thing I would add to what's been shared again is that um, that was sort of our our stretch goal um, of being able to utilize that full building, and we've come for, far enough into the process to realize that that um, that was a stretch goal, um, and at the same time, still feeling really super optimistic about the fact that in the midst of COVID and wildfires and cost escalation that we're able to meet bond promises that a previous board voted on um, with, with dots, um, a, a dot activity um, all those years ago. So um, it's pretty incredible to think that some of the decisions that were made so many years ago uh, without understanding any of these circumstances um, and conditions um, are still coming to fruition. So, um, I, I do I do hear that and I feel the same way about that um, that project and recognizing that we've opened two schools this year is pretty done, pretty phenomenal. Thank you. Sarah? Yeah, I just I mean I'm it's again followed up on what was just said that it, when we started when we initially were talking about the bond and asking the community to support it, the working on the two-story building wasn't really even something we were thinking about at that point. It was sort of after the fact that we realized we had more reserves than we anticipated. So I just want to be clear that you know, this is absolute, the, that, while it's disappointing that that's not being done, it was not, it, is, it was never part of that initial promise and ask. Um, so we are absolutely still making um, you're still meeting the promises we set when we asked the community to support this. Um, and I also just, you know, with all the things we've listed and the challenges we've faced in this process, the fact that we have been able to get to where we are, where we're you know, looking at students and new buildings and, and you know, final projects being started is you know, really a credit to the work that's been done by you know, the, the boots on the ground people who you know, asked for bids multiple times and chased down delayed um, materials and dealt with you know, things that we would win that in that slide that said, you know, unanticipated conditions. If, if there was ever a time when unanticipated conditions was an issue, it was, you know, it's this time that we've asked our, um, our staff and our contractors to be building schools for us. So mm -hmm. 
um, it's pretty amazing that we are where we are. Yeah, it's um, it's funny for me or interesting for me to think back because now all of our board meetings are recorded. Um, if there was a recording of that meeting where board members were discussing, you know, here's the the dollar amount, and here's the projects that, that we're talking about at each school, and these are the ones I, I would prioritize. And having that discussion that went on for a long period of time um, in this room, um, and again, prior to recording, so you can't go back and watch it, but I wish I could, because having seen and heard all of that debate and now living it, I, it would be interesting to hear how close the debate aligned with what the reality was and where it doesn't quite fit, um, because it was um, it was a challenge. And I know there, there was angst in it. Oh, what about this idea? What about this project? Do you think we can do it? Um, to, to be to be where we are now, it, it's just fun to think back to sort of that naive uh, <laughs> condition at that point we, in time. We definitely didn't put in any cushioning for worldwide pandemic. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah we, we, we put some in reserve. Uh, <laughs> uh, what kind of uh, readiness do we have for a pandemic and wildfires and uh, so many disruptions? Uh, one thing I, I feel really thankful for is, is having our priorities and values straight, uh, life safety, and what's uh, the best uh, uh, of protecting our operation and our students and their health. And, uh, and having that prioritization has been proven really good. And uh, taking care of our staff, our contractors as well uh, during difficult times. So I'm really thankful that, uh, yeah, we had those discussions and uh, with limitation of resources, whether it's an ask for a bond or an implementation of the bond uh, during uh, uh, times of uncertainty, uh, I'm grateful that we have really clarity on our values. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Shana. So there's so much to celebrate with as as we near coming up to the end of the the bond and seeing the bond promise that's been met along the way and how much has been changed so far. And of course, I almost hate to ask this question because it feels like you know, we wanna hold on to all those things that we can celebrate, especially at this time when it feels like so much is continually in flux. So I don't wanna minimize that at all. And as we look forward and carry some of these things that may not have happened with this current bond, like the seismic upgrades at College Hill or, we heard last last week, and I know that there's been ongoing conversation with um, with a group at Franklin School, for instance, for asks that they have for upgrades to that school, and I'm sure that there may be others as well. Just for my own learning and for the community that might be listening in now or in the recording, what do future steps look like? And we don't have to go into big details, but in terms of those things that come out of, okay, here are the next things that we're hoping the district will do. Does that go into a future a future bond initiative? Does that go into, are there other initiatives coming up that folks can be thinking toward as some of those asks or needs arise? Really great question, Shana. And, uh, maybe I'll give a high picture and maybe Ryan, you want to uh, uh, sure. fill in the blanks there. Yeah. Uh, the cycle of improvement, uh, proving our facilities starts when the one ends or almost before the one ends. And uh, this cycle started probably years before I joined in 2017 where there was this exploration of well, what do our facilities need? And uh, my understanding is the process of a long range facility plan, uh, a new one will start as, as soon as we start concluding uh, implementation of that, yep. uh, this bond. Uh, I don't know if we want to add anything to that, Ryan. Yeah, no, so that is one of those pieces is that um, we will start working on our long range facilities plan um, at the conclusion of this bond. Um, so again, that process is ongoing. There's some statutory requirements around making sure that we are um, doing, um, doing planning around facilities. And then there's also, um, there are always projects that take place um, year over year. And those are um, primarily um, come through the facilities department budget um, and a construction excise tax that the district has um, access to. So th there's a couple of different sources of, um, of funding, and those are for smaller projects that happen over time. So those things will continue to happen um, even after the conclusion and the completion of the bond. At one point in time, we had brought to the board some projects that we had hoped to do if we had additional bond reserves at the end. Um, and as we get closer to the end, recognizing that that's not 
um, something that will necessarily happen. Um, I think that that is, but that also helps us to generate other area, other things that we know over time we need to continue to work on and improve. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you, Shana. Any other questions or comments? Well, I wanna conclude it with a gratitude for the voters for investing in our school and for the community for investing in our school and an urge for all of us, uh, appeal for all of us to uh, invest in school infrastructure and make sure that uh, uh, school districts don't starve to make sure our uh, schools and facilities are, uh, are updated. Uh, there is lots of need and the resources are scarce and we're doing the best we can do and we're doing an excellent job with it. Uh, so with that, uh, moving on to the next item on the agenda, uh, within the bond updates as well, point B is Mountain View Elementary guaranteed maximum price and bond reserve allocation. Uh, is there any questions to staff before we entertain a motion? Seeing none, is there a motion? Dr. Adams. I move to authorize staff to execute a guaranteed maximum price amendment with Fortis Construction for the Mountain View Elementary Addition and Renovation Project in the amount of $14,742,546 and authorize a total bond reserve allocation for the Mountain View Project in the amount of $8,468,569. Thank you. Any other questions? Second by Vice Chair Stephanie McDonald. Is there, for, is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, the board is going to enter into a vote uh, on the motion to authorize staff to execute a guaranteed maximum price amendment with forest construction for the Mountain View Elementary Addition and Renovation Projects in the amount of $14,742,000. An approved allocation of bond reserves in the amount of eight million and four hundred sixty-eight thousand five hundred sixty-nine dollars to the Mountain View Elementary Addition and, and renovation to fully fund the project. Director Adams. Aye. Director Tommy. Aye. And Dr. Jones is excused. Go by chair will be right there. Uh, and Dr. Baker. Aye. And co by chair Samuel Saffron Lundano. Aye. Child double with time. And the motion passes six to nine. Congratulations. Thank you, Dale. Have a good evening. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Good night. Homeless education program update. The school board hears a report every year on the homeless education program update, uh, also known by McKinney Vento Act uh, Overview or Update. And I would like to welcome Sarah Devine and Amy Layson uh, to the board. Oh, Sabrina. Sabrina, I'm Sabrina, sorry. Boy. So Sabrina, uh, welcome, and uh, uh, and uh, Sabrina and Sarah Devine, welcome to the meeting, and thank you for preparing the report uh, uh, and uh, in the packet. Uh, Ryan, uh, Sabrina, and Sarah, the floor is yours. All right. So um, Sabrina and um, Sarah are here to answer questions for you this evening. One of the things that um, we talked about um, at the end of the meeting last time, I think, believe it was a question from Therese, was about this report. And we and one of the things I also shared was how in the future, um, later this spring, we want to come back to the board, including um, a number of um, services that are provided to students, um, students navigating poverty, as well as just the general services that we have developed over time and the way that those are um, connected with one another to support the whole child. So um, well, we'll have we'll have the support report tonight. Um, Sarah will have the opportunity to come back at a later date, along with Sabrina, to provide uh, a more comprehensive, holistic update. Ryan, can I say something about that really quick? Absolutely. I think one of the things that 
um, we felt like is important is that as the board has really embraced the health and wellness goal and all of the different pieces that we've strategically introduced to support students and families, it seemed important to stop reporting on them in isolation as though they each operate as one little thing and really kind of talk about and process the work as it is a collective picture of services that serve students and families and talk about how they are as they connect to each other and not just as they operate in isolation. So just to give a little bit of context for why we thought it was time to probably move in that direction as we have a much more robust set of programming that serves our students and families now. Thank you. And with that, if there are any questions or comments. Vince. Sorry, it takes a while to navigate the interface and get everything going. Um, so thank you so much for this report. I always look forward, well, look forward to this report. That's not the right thing. Maybe dread this report. It's just, a, it's a hard topic. But it's one that I'm I'm very interested in and care a lot about, so I'm always looking forward to it. Um, I did make a re I sent an email in requesting uh, the data in a different form, uh, disaggregated. I'm just wondering if so. Historically, the board is, has received uh, data across the four categories where uh, kiddos can access McKinney Vento resources, um, and also I'm. So I was I was wanted to see if we could get if the board could get the data disaggregated that way, because I think that tells a deeper story about what's going on with homelessness with our kids. Um, the other is is getting data over time, and so with that maybe we can look retro, retrospectively and see what the trend is, um, and try to tell stories with that, so we can have a better understanding of, you know, where this where this is going. Um, my question is the count that you gave us, you, you said the total number identified uh, was 190. Is that an unduplicated count or is that, that is an unduplicated count? I see Sarah nodding. Yes, it is. Um, and I did, I was able to pull the data by, it's not in the report because it was after, but I do have the data broken into categories and I'm happy to share that right now. So as of right now, we have 157 students who are doubled up, so sharing housing with another family due to some kind of financial crisis. We have 15 who were living in hotels or motels, 14 living in shelter, and four who were unsheltered. So that's the category that would capture cars, tents, um, housing that is so substandard, like all the windows are broken and there's no you know, utilities, that kind of thing. And then we have um, 36, I think to, as of today, 37 um, youth who are unaccompanied and homeless. So some things I can just kind of, a little narrative I can give there is the number in hotels and motels, as I mentioned, is higher. The number in shelters is much lower. Um, and that speaks to, I think likely, at least in one, one portion, just that we have less shelter capacity right now. We have no emergency shelter that has opened this winter. Um, the other thing that makes this data a little bit trickier to interpret is that it only captures the first homeless situation that a family was in for the year. So we flag them with whatever situation they're in when we discover that they're homeless or when they become homeless, but we all, for example, we have more than 15 students living in a hotel or motel right now. It's just that some of them were doubled up or they were in a shelter or something else first. So just kind of keeping in mind that this data is interesting and it doesn't actually paint the full picture of what we're seeing, um, but that's those numbers for you. Um, I would say happily, our numbers are higher than they were last year. So we're back on track um, with stronger reporting than we had during full distance learning. Um, but we will absolutely have kind of the five year and that often I think when we do it, we do break it down by category as well over that time. So you can see kind of the shifting trends, not just through the pure numbers, but also through like shelter stays and hotels, motels, things like that. Um, you can expect that in the report that comes in the spring later. Thank you. And that was going to be my follow up question is, would we get more detailed data, you know, in the spring? And I, I really like the idea of, of, Giving us a report, giving the board a report on a wrap services in association with this rather than in isolation. That makes a whole lot of sense. Um, yeah. And I think the piece about that that's important to me is that 
when we start to think about all of the services that we provide to students and families, we can start to think about intersectionality more completely. So when we look at one report and one set of data, we're not necessarily looking at how are students and families of color showing up as needing services or students with disabilities or students with disabilities who are also people of color. Like how do these intersectionalities impact the data become super important. And I think when we pull things out and we don't look at the whole set, we sometimes miss how all of those intersectionalities run into each other and then impact what we're doing. So to your point, Vince, yes. And I think having an opportunity to look at all of those things in the greater context will allow us to look at the data in a way that might be a little more contextually appropriate. Thank you for that. And I'm gonna put my hand down because Lou is behind me and wants to ask a question, but I have another question. Sure, Lou. Um, mine had, like, when you said that there's actually more than um, that in the hotels, I'm wondering um, if, what kind of education is about, um, sorry, my words today, what kind of education is given to students around personal safety? Um, that's an area of concern for me just because of some vo other volunteer work I do around like trafficking kind of stuff. And um, there was that recent article of that sting in town <laughs> in a hotel. And so um, that's one thing that is always a concern for me when I know of youth staying in areas that are often targeted um, by folk like that. And I'm just wondering if you all do um, educational resources for youth so that way community knows that's happening. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I would say we do that often just case by case as part of our general um, just connection and support with families. And that could be whether they're in a motel or a, any other kind of situation. And it's really led often um, as most of our work is by, by families and by us presenting different options um, and hoping that that gives the tools for informed decision making. So yes, I think you know we're aware that we have students um, in some motels and hotels where there have been different incidents over time. Um, it's something our team is keenly aware of. It's definitely something that we're checking in with parents about. And then to the best of our ability, we offer whatever tools um, or resources that we can for them. Great to hear, because when it's coupled with the unaccompanied piece, it gets a... <laughs> There's, there's a lot of, I have a lot of things I think about um, around this and so, and it's just an area that's near and dear to us, so thank you. Yeah, and I think the piece about that to remember too is the main operation for DHS, right, continues to be having students have to stay in hotels when they can't find an appropriate foster placement. So you think about how those two worlds cross over in those settings. Thanks, you all, and thanks for bringing that part into Sabrina. That's what I mean. There's so many pieces I don't think that people are aware about that go into this. And so, yeah, anyway. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll ask one and then go back to you, Vincent. Maybe I'll ask that one after you. How about that? So, uh, my first question would be uh, what kind of collaboration do we have with uh, agencies and organizations? And uh, the first one comes to mind with, uh, following the last question is CASA. Uh, or any other organizations uh, to make sure we're giving uh, kids the support that they need. We have pretty strong collaboration across a lot of our service providers in the community. One of the positives that came out of the shutdown and the time in COVID is that there's increased um, kind of meetings and communication among providers, whether that's specific to housing or homelessness or food security. Um, and one of the benefits of our team expanding this year is that, that has freed up time for myself and others on our team to attend more meetings and be a little more active as opposed to only managing, you know, a caseload of families. And so we have, yeah, I would say it's, it's quite strong. Um, you know, we often are kind of collaborating in the ways that we offer case management and support for families just based on the different resources that each agency has. And a lot of the families we work with, there are so many areas um, where we can offer that help and no one can do it all. And so um, one thing we've really been working on 
is just getting to know on a personal level some of the folks that are other key agencies in town so that we have that quick access and can ask questions and get them answered quickly um, and reach out when we have emergency situations and things like that. And it's been quite successful and it's just a goal that our program has and that we continue to have. Um, we invite, it's all virtual at this point, but we invite them to come to our meetings and we, one of us or more of us will go to their meetings um, to learn more on kind of the you know bottom level of how agencies function. And that really does help us when we have crisis situations um, or just to have a stronger knowledge as agencies are ever changing and what they offer changes. Um, the more that we have those personal relationships and that um, close communication really helps the ways that we're able to support families. I'm, I hope I answered your question. You did, wonderful. This is wonderful, good to hear. Uh, sorry, Ms. Elba, Sarah uh, first. Sarah and Ms. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So I don't even know if we really have this information, but when I, I look at that 190 number, you know, I wonder, you know, as we think about services and, and what families and kids need, are we looking at families, you know, especially after the last year, are we looking at families who are you know, ex experiencing a sort of chronic homelessness? Are we are, are we looking at new families that are coming and going every year? Because it just seems to me like we, we how we would serve those families and what resources they would need would change based on that. And you 190 and you know, last year was whatever number it was, and you know, I don't I just, I'm just thinking about the home, the unhoused population in our community and, and what their needs might be and, and, and how the community thinks of them and supports that are needed long-term versus you know, sort of acute crisis versus sort of chronic crisis. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up that point. I would say it's both, right? Like, so out of that number, we have, we have both of those situations. And the other piece that is still true is that we have this patchwork of types of, we don't have like an eviction moratorium anymore, but there are still protections in place, but they're uneven. And so over time, it's like certain groups of people lose, you know, now the rent that they owed for that six months back in, you know, 2020 is due. And so we have like these fits and starts kind of bursts of, of folks who lose all protection and might become homeless. And that could be for the first time or not. Um, but I would say it's both. And it's true that the ways, um, and even, you know, if you step slightly outside of McKinney Vento into eviction prevention, um, and homeless prevention, which is a huge thing that our team does, there are times where whether it's because of a you know a quarantine for COVID or something else, um, we have a family who typically makes rent and maybe one month they're short a bit. And that's where sometimes ourselves or other organizations might be able to just step in and provide that support for a family that may not need um, a ton of just like regular work with us ongoing. Um, and that's something we can do, whether it's maybe a family who's newly housed and we're helping them maintain that housing or a family who has never become homeless and we want to keep it that way. Um, so there's a real diverse range of needs um, over, you know, what that 190 represents. And then the other folks that aren't counted in this number because they're not under McKinney-Vento that are on everyone's caseloads. Um, and often it, it might look like, you know, we can come in and just provide, like I said, a one-time um, intervention that in that moment at least kind of stabilizes the situation versus a student or a family who, you know, we're coordinating care with like four other organizations because there's so much going on. And there are so many ways that we're offering that support simultaneously. I, tell me if that didn't answer your question, but it's quite no, good. I, just, it, I mean, it just seems like a really complex, you know, I, I just feel like that 190 number doesn't really represent what, you know, the diversity of situations that, that families are, are navigating. I think some of that too comes from, I think, I think we're in a middle space between traditional ways of reporting what students and families need and how poverty and other kind of discriminating areas show up into as school districts adapt programs to serve students and families more whole there will become more effective ways to report that, but we don't have that yet. So we're still stuck with these really kind of rigid things like free and reduced lunch or McKinney Vinto, which has very clear language around what qualifies and what doesn't. And I think to your point, Sarah, um, there's a lot of complexity that 
that operates around that and spins around that. And we just don't yet have a mechanism to report that that's kind of federally recognized. And I think that will come as school districts change what they're up to. And more and more you see schools offering a wrap service or a wrap option. I think we'll have better ways of talking about that complexity that isn't so narrow. We're just not there yet. Thanks, hey, Karina. Uh, thanks, Alex. So Vincent and Lou and myself. So, you know, the, the board is going to be uh, taking up budget parameters here in just a little bit. And one of the elements in the parameters is focusing on the kids that with need and, you know, allocating resources accordingly. And you work with the kids with some of the highest levels of need. And so what you're doing is incredibly important. You make a mention in here that you've increased staffing and goodness knows over the last, you know, two years. You guys have literally worked miracles, okay? And so I, but I am concerned as, and, you know, over the next three years, as we see federal funding wane, how are we going to sustain the effort to keep doing the work that you're doing? Because while we see the economy running fairly well, unemployment is low, there are people being left behind, you know, and the housing shortage isn't going away. That is a structural problem. So... Do we have a plan going forward is, I guess, my question. And I just want to express my deep concern about making sure that you have the resources you need to do the work that you're doing. I mean, I can pause like awkwardly. And then if Olivia just like wanted to turn her camera back on and then we could put her on the spot, but I don't think she'll appreciate that very much. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Olivia. <laughs> I think that, um, what feels meaningful to me is that all of this work falls under a board goal. And so as strategic budget work happens, as you continue to have to grapple with hard questions, like you just said, I think it's continuing to come back to the plans and the goals you set and having conversations about how those impact the decisions we make around funding. And I think that will continue to anchor this conversation for this group, as well as the budget committee and the work that Olivia leads that will help people stay focused on what did you already decide you wanted to be focused on and what did you already say you wanted to do? And I think that will help to make some of those harder decisions. Thank you for that clear call for action from the board. I appreciate it. Hello. This is more around the numbers again and thinking about um, is there's probably youth out there that are not included in this number, right? And um, a lot of that has to do with stigmas about homelessness and um, students feeling like they can't ask for help. And I don't, um, this is more of a, I don't know what kind of question this is, but <laughs> if there's um, if there's anything being done, um, maybe this isn't even a question for the two of you, but like as a district to help like push back on some of those stigmas around homelessness because it's a, it's framed a very certain way in this community. And it does cause these ripple effects with youth that I don't think people understand where it makes people really ashamed to ask for help and even to admit that they are in a situation that they're in. I think the most effective way we're addressing that now is actually by the work of the mental health program at large which I think is intricately like woven into that um, in the same way where we think about at a basic level, what you just said, like, is it okay to ask for help? Is it okay to not have it figured out? Is it okay to say something? And I think the more that we normalize that practice of talking about what's hard, of asking for help from making it a part of what we do, the more that those reporting methods will get away from, I need to come to the front office and tell everybody that I no longer have a place to live, which is how this works in essence, right? I mean, you either hear by, by hearsay or you walked into the office and said, I don't have somewhere to live. And the reality is that information is much more meaningfully shared when we have people with connections where they feel connected and have a relationship and share. And then that information becomes something that isn't just a statistic, but is the work that we're doing as we have all of these people in our building, school counselors and family advocates and mental health therapists and skills trainers and classroom teachers who are all having these conversations. I think that is what will shift that away from what I think you're talking about, which has kind of been driven by, are you willing to walk in and make an announcement or not? Yeah. 
And I would say a couple other pieces that kind of come to my mind, similar to what Sabrina was saying, having, having increased staff capacity has also meant increased training and awareness. And so, you know, our goal might be in some situations that it's not that a student or a parent you know, comes in and has the exact right language and is comfortable, you know, sharing these um, sometimes really deeply personal um, experiences, um, but that we also might be just more aware of subtext and um, just more tuned in to hearing things that kind of then make us think this might be a family I want to check in on again, um, or I'm going to ask a few more questions, or I'm going to find a private time um, to do a check in. So that's one thing It's just the more, you know, with our mental health team and with other folks in our buildings, um, we really are trying to integrate some of that awareness, um, whether it's specifically around McKinney Vento or not, and it frequently is not, um, just to make sure that we're, you know, able to sort of read between the lines a little bit more um, so that folks don't have to feel like they're coming, you know, just like straight with this full disclosure all at once. Another thing that has really helped us, I think, in terms of, you know, speaking directly to these numbers, um, is that we also provide multiple avenues for having those referrals happen. So frequently, I might actually find out about a student or a family that is experiencing homelessness by virtue of my connection to another service provider um, who gets permission from the family who's maybe sheltering them um, or working with them in another capacity. And then because I have those strong relationships and other people on our team have those strong relationships, we have that avenue come in. Um, we've implemented some ways that families can self-refer directly to a family advocate. Um, and that really just speaks to, I think as well, our desire that if a family wants to receive services from our program, we don't want that to need to go through like an office staff member or a teacher if they're more comfortable accessing it another way. And so our team is also extremely clear um, that we will provide those services and really um, the family and the student are in charge of their story and where and how that story is shared with the school. And so if the, you know, if the referral comes from a community agency directly to me, it's up to the family how much gets spoke, you know, gets told into who and when. Um, we give that control directly to the students and families in question. Thanks, y'all. And um, I really appreciate the work you all are doing um, as a former homeless youth. I understand like the importance of these services, especially not receiving them when I was in school. And so um, I know how much of an impact y'all are having on the youth out there and just really appreciate y'all. Thank you, Shana? I was going to ask a question that built off what you were just sharing, Sarah, because it sounds like really what you're building is sort of a no wrong door approach in terms of anybody who might have contact with a youth or, or a, a younger student, a child or a family member and hears or, or understands some of the circumstance and might be able to make that referral in a really gentle way, a warm handoff way. And so my question related to that is, is there training, awareness, building support among all staff in the district to really understand what's being offered or at least to point them to if they're the ones to make that connection, even accidentally in their relationships with children or families, how and who to best contact? Yeah, um, so part of my job is to go to every school every year and do a brief training. Um, and that's kind of, a, I consider that really a bare minimum. Um, it's normal that I do more involved trainings like with school counselors that's specific to their roles. Um, if I can, ideally with office staff, like specific to their roles, um, you know, and really looking at kind of tailoring, tailoring that awareness and providing tools um, based sometimes more in that. But yes, we go to every school. Um, that's also the benefit of having support staff like family advocates in buildings um, because they can really do things that I can't do as some when trying to bounce around and serve multiple schools because they're just embedded in that process. And I think that, um, you know, their presence in buildings really raises that awareness as well. Thanks for, sh for sharing that. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. I want to ask you, let's take a pause now and just really reflect on the phenomenal work you do. Uh, and there is always more work to be done. But I want to reflect on how we're really making a dent in the future of those kids, 190 kids, and each one have a unique story and, and potential and dreams, and we're helping them to accomplish them. So I just want to reflect on my gratitude for you making that happen, one kid at a time, one family at a time. 
And I, I, I'm trying to have a, a checklist for us as board members and advocates in the community. And I heard shelter capacity is a need. And I heard uh, the temporary financial support that we get uh, for families uh, when uh, they have this uh, immediate disruption can really solve lots of problems and mitigate uh, many uh, future consequences. So every dollar there uh, saves a lot of dollars and lots of uh, suffering. Um, I also heard some complexities around the McKinney Vento reporting and that it does not capture the full uh, depth of uh, the situation. And, and sometimes it's not empowering, as empowering as we want it to be. And I would like to ask you if you have a whiteboard and you can list the things that have high priority, high impact. Um, I would start off with sustaining the good work you do uh, against any financial disruptions as Vince mentioned. So that's number one on the list, sustaining the work we do as long as we can. What else? What should we prioritize from that list? I would say the other huge one that always comes to my mind first is affordable housing that's permanent. We have very, very, very little of that. And our vacancy rate, I think right now is sitting at about 1%, so. Yeah, I think that um, the next piece that comes for me is, is literally how you talk about this in the community and the importance of thinking about um, building awareness as well as building awareness in a way that is really trauma-informed and strength-based and culturally responsive. And the way that we can talk about people who are navigating homelessness or just navigating the complexities of poverty can be pretty harmful. Um, when we don't think about how our words portray a story and, and an image. And I think it's a fine line balancing the critical work with how we actually talk about them as humans. And um, I think there's kind of political policy work that should happen around how are we actually doing this as a community in Corvallis, which is not a notorious community for taking care of their homeless population at all. And how do we talk about this that preserves humanity and dignity? Um, and I think both of those are a place where a school board can hold that in the community and in conversation. And I think another piece, I'm um, just thinking based on what Sabrina just said, and it's it's on my mind now because the point in time count that happens every year through HUD is happening this month or maybe next month because of our COVID surge. Um, any of the, so 157 students, the vast majority doubled up. That's true every year. That's true across the state. That's true generally across the country. None of them are considered homeless under the HUD definition and don't even get count. They don't get counted in that point in time count, which determines funding and other things that happen. So that's just a piece that I think illustrates the larger reality that homeless families and homeless students still continually are invisible in discussions around homelessness in this community and in other communities too. Um, and even just that, that awareness raising and kind of bringing those pieces um, in, into the conversation, which is part of why I think it's so, you know, our additional capacity has been so wonderful in that we get to be at the table in more of those groups and able to kind of bring our perspective and we've really been welcomed. And um, it seems like our perspective is valued. We've had some really exciting, you know, kind of partnerships and developments based on that. Um, but continued, I would say that that homeless families are not always um, kind of at the forefront of, of some of those pieces. So that's just something our team is certainly keenly aware of and trying to keep that awareness raising going in the community. Thank you. Ben? Since you brought up the point, uh, point in time count, um, I have the email in front of me. It's happening on January 26th, and they are looking for volunteers to help with the pit count. So if you're interested in supporting that effort, it is really, really important. Um, reach out to Community Services Consortium. Since any training or qualification or anyone from the community or our board colleagues can do that. Any 
No, they will they will train you to do the to do the count. They're using a different methodology. They've been working with Oregon State University to update the methodology to try and get a more accurate count. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. I don't want to take up more time though. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I appreciate it. All right, with that, our time is up actually, and I want to just thank you uh, for the work and uh, for the advocacy and also for uh, the homework that we need to do at the school board to continue supporting this work that you do. So thank you for that. Uh, Ryan, any concluding remarks? No, just uh, appreciation for the team. They are um, doing incredible work and um, just, you know, every question that you had for them tonight, they have a story behind and um, a lot of experience with. And so I would say, could just continue to rely on their expertise. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks a lot and uh, take care and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Good night. Good night. Education updates with Ryan. Uh, so tonight, um, as it has been many times throughout the pandemic, it's uh, Ryan and Melissa. And so we have some slides to share with you with some updates. Um, and again, many of our updates are related to COVID. Um, as we continue to move through the final several days of this surge um, of Omicron. So we wanted to provide you with some updated information, some changes that are underway. Um, and so today we are sent out a, a staff update. We've also sent out a community update, again, to inform um, both of where we're at right now and, and also where we're headed. Um, and it, Felt like an appropriate day to do that because we also had a chance to be outward facing and sharing information with you. So we have a couple of slides to share and some of the information is, is a theme that you've heard over time. Some of it is some real specifics about changes that are underway. And so we will um, do our best to provide you that information. And again, along the way, um, don't hesitate to ask questions. So with that, um, go ahead and uh, shift to the next slide. All right, so um, again, from the school health advisory, um, those reports and updates come out frequently. The most recent one, again, highlighted some of the things we do continue to know that um, proper wearing of masks, proper social distancing, following those steps and processes that we've had over time continue to be um, key and vital, as well as vaccination. And so um, we are continuing to see um, an uptick. Um, we think that we'll see that uptick through the weekend um, when we will potentially hit the peak. Um, and then we'll start to slowly move back down, um, slowly, it feeling slowly, but in terms of the ways that this has um, ebbed and flowed over time, it's a, it was a pretty quick um, up and it's gonna be a pretty, um, uh, pretty quick decline in, in rates and numbers. Um, but again, that's where we're at today. Um, so this is the was information shared by the Department of Education, their North Star, but it really aligns with um, our North Star as well right now. Um, we know that keeping our schools open is critical. And while we're able to keep our schools open, we will do so. Um, having been um, two years into this, nearly the end of the second year of the pandemic, we know how critical this is and something that we're um, continuing to focus and emphasize rather than thinking about closures, we're continuing to think about how do we keep our schools open. So while we have plans in case we had to close the school, our intention and our focus is on keeping our schools open. And so that is the North Star for us at this point in time. We know that um, kids do better when they're um, in school in person. Um, for almost all kids, we know that families rely on our schools. Um, we know that our kids are fed and cared for in our schools. We also know that schools are still a safe place for our students to be. And so emphasizing that and continuing to emphasize that um, is a key importance for all of us. Um, and it's a message that we're gonna continue to share. Um, you have seen this um, visual over time, but again, I think it's a really important reminder that in schools, we have a number of layers 
in place. Um, I've been able to spend the last several days um, at Linus Pauling, and what I have seen is I have seen kids who are wearing their masks consistently. I see kids that are have um, lots of experience with following these rules and requirements because they've been in place for quite some time now. And so I feel um, really proud of our students and the ways that they continue to take this to heart and the, and the role that they play um, in keeping our schools open along with all of the rest of us. So um, again, I think that it's, it's become a norm um, because it's been an expectation over time and our kids um, do a really tremendous job. Um, I, they're as exhausted and tired of it as we are and they still do what they need to do um, because they also want to be able to stay in school. All right, it's my turn. So last week, um, Calvin was hitting us hard with those questions about what are we doing specifically with regard to Omicron to make sure that we're keeping our staff and our students healthy. Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. And this again is um, information that went out to parents today through Parent Square. So um, more thorough explanation and written down so people can access it um, and reference it if they have questions. The first thing that we see under the update is symptomatic staff or students. We've made a change um, in response to the Omicron surge. And that is that beginning on Tuesday, January 18th, any staff or student who has any symptoms will be required to produce a negative PCR test to come back to work or school. Um, the symptoms are so, but the spread is so intense and the symptoms are so mild that um, people are kind of, um, they're mistaking things like a, just a little bit of a headache or a tiny tickle in the throat that ends up becoming, um, you know, full blown uh, a COVID positive. And in the meantime, they've been at school or at work and they um, exposed other staff or students. So we want to make sure and keep everyone healthy by doing that. The um, other things that we've done uh, is uh, connect to the guidance that ODE and OHA put out earlier this week, actually on January 10th. And that is um, a new terminology that we're using. You might have in the past been asked if you or your child were fully immunized. We're not using that language anymore. The CDC language is now up to date with vaccination. Up to date with vaccination means if you are over 18 and you've received both of your initial shots and you are eligible for a booster, that you've had that booster. That makes you up to date for vaccination. A lot of information in the parent square message explains um, uh, when you should be getting your booster shot. But basically, if you have the Moderna or Pfizer booster, you need to have the booster shot within five months of that second vaccination. And Johnson & Johnson, it's any time after the second month from that initial vaccination. We're going to be asking staff and students if they are up to date with vaccination, if they are close contact at school with someone who is COVID positive. It's um, important for us to have that distinction because that indicates what their next step is because a student or staff who is up to date with vaccination does not have to quarantine if they don't have symptoms and they have been a close contact with someone who's COVID positive. We're also following along with the ODE and OHA um, guidance that actually came from the CDC first and that is um, shortened isolation time for people who are COVID positive and shortened quarantine periods for those who are um, exposed or what are not so we want to say exposed either we say close contact um, with someone who is COVID positive. The um, important piece to note here is that when you are COVID positive and you have um, you're serving your five days of isolation that's the new time frame is five days it used to be 10. The other five days when you come back to work or school you're going to have some extra requirements um, in place and that includes wearing a well-fitting mask um, which in this case is um, really important for us that um, we have those KN95 masks for students who um, are coming back from their five-day quarantine. Also, if you can't wear that mask um, in an activity, for example, basketball, wrestling, or swimming, you cannot participate in those activities for those five days. And that's coming from the state and from the county as well. We are also going to change our communication um, to the community, as well as in particular when those um, COVID cases come up. Our communication to the community um, is going to show up beginning tomorrow, later in the day, with a new and improved COVID-19 dashboard. 
That dashboard is going to include numbers like the daily total of reported cases, the weekly total of reported cases. We're also going to have two cumulative columns, one from the start of the school year, but one from January 3rd, because it's very dramatic, the change or the increase of numbers when, when you look at the change from um, the start of school year or January 3rd. And then lastly, the communications processes are going to change um, because we are in a surge and we have so many responses that we're trying to, um, to take care of. We need to change the way that we communicate in order to be sure that we do all the things that are most important. Um, if you've never been part of a COVID response in the district, I think it's important to, to note that um, we're contact tracing. We're doing all of those conversations on the, on the phone with the person who's positive. Who did you eat lunch with? Who were you within six feet of for more than 15 minutes? We're um, making those contacts. We're determining if they're immunized. We're calling those people to and telling them what their next step is. We're also monitoring the test to save protocol, the quarantine protocol. We're, do, we're basically become the public health facility within the school district. And because we take that job so seriously and we make sure that we're doing it well, um, we are having to prioritize communications. We will continue to call or talk in person to staff and students who need to quarantine because they're close contacts. Um, but we're going to change up a little bit the um, conversations that, or I'm sorry, the emails that we send out to what we call an impacted classroom. Have you ever gotten an impacted oh, classroom yeah. email? Um, so those emails typically come out, um, they, we have to wait until all of the close contacts are spoken to before we send that to everybody else. And we wanna make really clear that that's just like, we're just letting you know COVID was in the room, but we know that your kid for sure is not a close contact because we didn't call you. So we're gonna to try to make sure that those are very clear, distinct, and that those emails are going out um, in a timely manner. And I think, and then also we'll make sure and, and contact bus riders as well as sports activities and anything else that might have been impacted by someone who was COVID positive. So a lot of changes this week in response to the Omicron surge, we were looking forward to the end of it for sure. Absolutely. And so um, one of the pieces that I think is important to, to share, but also uh, a component that we're hoping to uh, continue to persevere and not have to move to would be to move to any sort of remote learning. And for us, that would be a conversation and a decision that would be made at, um, school by school. It wouldn't be a decision that would be made across the entire district. And there's conditions at each of our individual schools that we're paying close attention to. Um, we have um, sort of deployed our team um, to be at schools that are working and supporting directly. And we are talking at the end of every day um, to say, how are, how are things looking for tomorrow with regards to case count, with regards to staffing, um, that's something we've seen far and wide has been um, concerns around um, staff availability. So those are the things we're paying attention to and the conversations that we're having um, every afternoon in anticipation of the next school day being in person. Um, one of the other things that I would uh, highlight and recognize is um, as Melissa talked about, the, the role that um, we are playing in the health of our students. Our, um, our nursing team has been working um, incredibly hard. Um, we have one person in particular who is sort of at the center of all of these contacts and calls and has been putting in um, long hours. Um, and not this is not the first time they've had to do that throughout this pandemic. So again, appreciation for staff um, who continue to um, help us um, to navigate and work through this and help us to get information to schools and help us to get information to families um, as quickly as possible. So again, I think that um, what I would want you to remember from this slide is again, that this is not our intention, but it is something that we have a plan for if we we're have to, gonna have to implement it with notice um, to, uh, a day in advance, potentially um, before we were to start um, in distance learning or remote learning. But again, this is um, not the way we're hoping to head and recognizing that we are just a couple of days from the, the, the top of the peak. Um, again, a, a lot of hope that that won't be the case. Um, so changing um, gears completely, 
We also, um, because this is an education update, there's more than one topic. Um, while it feels like COVID is the topic um, for today, um, we have a we still have a survey out for families to complete related to the local auction levy in areas um, that they see important um, in that um, in those in that funding. And so that's open through um, midnight tonight. So the time is short, but so far we've had um, well over 800 responses. Um, all information that's really valuable and helpful, helpful to us as we think about that local option levy and areas for investment. So um, again, I will open it up for questions related to, primarily related to um, COVID would be my guess, but we wanted to make sure that there was time for that from the board. Also recognizing that that information went out to families today and that you may um, have some questions coming your way. So we want to equip you with the information you need. Sarah. Yeah, I was wondering um, if there have been any changes around athletics and activities. So we have um, not made any changes as after last Wednesday. Um, I've talked with our athletic directors multiple times. We have not seen um, transmission between athletes mm -hmm. um, in a way that would ca that cause us to think we need to move to that next level of intervention. Mm -hmm or that next level of um, Swiss cheese um, for the sake of the metaphor. Um, and so, but that is something we're continuing to watch um, every week. I think the biggest, the one change I would um, highlight though is something that Melissa shared and that is if you um, are not up to date um, and you have an exposure, then after that's five days returning to school, you still have to wear one of these in all, all locations um, on the, in the school setting. And so that would limit um participation mm -hmm. okay. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about um um spectators is there well last week the change for spectators was no eating in the gym okay. so that there's no excuse to have your mask, mask down and, but they're still there yeah and they're supposed to be sitting in groups of you know six feet apart masks on okay, okay. so that those things haven't changed okay. yeah yeah and I might have individual stories that maybe Sarah and I have heard from people. So uh, a question I have, I'm sorry, uh, ahead of the queue. Uh, if someone has a concern about the COVID-related compliance, uh, what's the process if they see a spectator or athletics or in-school uh, concern around COVID, uh, whether it is maybe exposure was not reported or uh, the procedures that were communicated have not been followed? Uh, where should uh, one go first and how they should go about it? So you gave it a couple of um, yeah. scenarios. So um, at, the, at the athletic event, our um, athletic directors or school principals or vice principals are present at all of those. So there should be an adult there that that information could be referred to. Um, within the school setting, I would say that those should be reported to um, staff in the office as well, um, because that's where those, um, that's, the clearest line of communication to the team that's working to address the outbreak. Thank you. Anything else you would add? No, and then it probably usually ends up with me too. <laughs> our staff have a very clear pathway as well. So if our staff are seeing a violation that they're concerned about, we ask that they first talk to their supervisor. And if it doesn't seem cleared up, we have a form that they can fill out that is on our website that goes directly to myself and the HR director, and we handle it from there. So we have a lot of opportunities for that too. Wonderful. And if I know anything about our culture, it's open. It's uh -huh. encouraging for that communication. So people should come be, feel comfortable to share that information because our interest is to help the uh, safety of all the kids. Exactly. Wonderful. And I, I would go back to uh, the, my, my experience over the last few days with middle schoolers is that they um, they have done a really good job. Um, and I think that unless you have the opportunity to sort of be in, in their spaces with them, seeing that take place, you don't get the sense, you don't really have the opportunity to see that play out. But I felt really, um, really proud of them um, over the last couple of days being there. I'm, I'm jumping in too, I'm sorry, but I've been, it's been sort of amazing watching kids leave school when I pick up kids or mm -hmm. I usually sort of see gangs of kids riding past my house on the way home from school. And a lot of them don't even take off their masks when they leave school. They've gotten mm -hmm. so used to wearing those masks, they walk out the door and you wear 
in my first thing I do is take off my mask. They're walking down the street. Yeah. Still have their mask on. Well, and I would say, you know, there's no um, environment that's perfect. But as I go about my life in a lot of different environments, I would say that um, I really feel like those during the school day, kids are doing a really good job. I agree. I agree. Kid, uh, kids school, K through 12, OSU. Uh, that is that fire is that list. I would say uh, I'm really impressed by the compliance of the younger generation. It's just inspiring, I would say. Um, Sean and Lou. So my question shifts gears a little bit to the local option levy. And as a parent, I actually received the the link, filled that out. I've seen it go out to I think through one of the local newspapers, sort of as a community call. And I was just wondering if there's been encouragement for staff to fill it out as well. I don't know if I've seen any communication to that effect. I know some are parents in the district, so received it that way. But as folks who are also invested community members and really invested in the schools themselves, just wondering if there's been communication to that effect. Yeah, that, that survey went directly to staff the day it came out. And so all of us as staff received it and were asked to take part in the survey and let, and let um, you know, hear our voices. So definitely. I've, I've completed mine as a, as a parent. Ooh. Hello? I had, I had um, sorry, I had to unmute it. I had a couple questions and I'm like, what was the other question? I wrote one of them down so I wouldn't forget. And then, <laughs> so maybe I'll come back eventually. But um, I have a question um, about mask. Um, if the district has um, thought about doing anything um, about requiring the surgical masks, like some other places are doing, or if the cloth masks are feeling safe still. And also um, if there's um, families that need masks, if there's ways, if there's resources for them to get masks. I know personally for my small one, her um, she's growing rapidly. And so her cloth masks were getting small anyways. And then Omicron hit and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and it wasn't fitting well. So she asked the teacher for one and that was really nice, but I know there's not a limitless supply in the classrooms um, before I could order her one, but that's my first question was about masks for sure. So we have a lot of surgical masks here in the district and we dole them out to all the schools. So if she needs a new mask every day, that's a surgical mask, we have those, those medical masks. Um, KN95s are also available to staff and students. We've had staff, especially this week, request them. And that's, it's super easy for them to request. And we just decided to pull that barrier back on Tuesday and our district staff who were going out to buildings started going out with just handfuls of KN95s, handing them out to any staff that were um, in the buildings that they were visiting, specifically our office staff who were out in the open and don't have the opportunity to like, you know, hide or isolate behind a closed door. Um, the uh, We're gonna have KN95 masks for students available, especially for those students coming back from a COVID isolation period so that they have a well-fitting mask that they can wear um, when they're at school. I remember the mask question. I don't remember what the first question was. I'm sorry. It was, it was all was about it masks about? so far. It was like, just like, okay. oh, it oh. was about if the district is looking oh, at okay. like that standard of what you wear yeah. is the surgical. If there is a supply and um, I got some for my kids, but I know some families can't do that. Um, yeah. And the KN95 prices just like skyrocketed rapidly too. And so yes. I know there's cost barriers for um, families and um, and I think related to masks too. Um, did it go, did it stay with, they don't have to wear them outside in our district? Right, they still don't have to wear them outside. Um, a lot of kids still do, but they don't have to. Um, and that has to do with studies that they did about transmission outside uh, on recess and kind of those fleeting moments between kids. Um, but um, as far as requiring a different kind of mask, we haven't moved there yet, but everything changes like every few days. So um, we'll keep an eye on, on that. We are strongly encouraging our staff and our students to change to either up to have a well-fitting mask and either a KN95 mask or uh, during the surge especially, or double masking. We've seen a lot of people putting the medical mask underneath the cloth mask um, or the other way around, however they want to do it. But that double masking is also a really good idea. Um, I didn't see any of that go out on Parent Square. And so that's kind of why I'm asking about the masks a lot because it was like, I understand there, that was also a very long message for 
<laughs> but yeah, totally I'm sorry. There's, there's a, there's a yeah. lot going on right now. We need the information and I appreciate the communication, but um, that was one thing I didn't see in there. And I know like right now that is like the biggest recommendation is like the KN95s or the surgical with um, like double masking with those or the cloth over or under my kid is like, it smells weird. So she has to wear it and it gets wet. So she wears the cloth one and then the surgical over it. So it's like closing all these gaps everywhere. But anyways, that that's where those questions were coming from because I didn't see anything go out yet about it. So that could be potentially something to put under um, some FAQs or something, just a recommendation. Absolutely. I'm, I'm looking at Kelly Losey's picture and I'm hoping that she's writing that down right now. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I know, uh, with that, I want to say thank you for the staff, uh, Ryan. Uh, we continue doing the work that we do uh, with our staff in terms of uh, making sure that they're well taken care of. And uh, uh, I really appreciate your leadership on that. Um, we appreciate their work. We want to keep them uh, and uh, make sure we care for them so they continue caring for uh, the children. And, um, and this one is all Melissa. So oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, our time is up for that. And I want to uh, ask the board if uh, you would like a five minutes break. We have 10 minutes of uh, financial uh, 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 discussion and then action and then a long list of policies. So would you like a, to have a five minutes break right now? There's no objection. We will be going for a recess. The board will stand at ease for five minutes.
All right, are board members ready to come back? The school board meeting reconvenes. Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, ACFR, uh, with Olivia. Um, okay, so this is normally presented as consolidated information to the board, but um, the new student investment account uh, grant requirements um, require us to make this a standalone item. Um, the board doesn't take any action on the report, but just acknowledges um, receipt of the report and, and a summary from staff, which is what was um, prepared for the meeting tonight and uploaded to board book. So um, again, no action required, just um, lots of loads of information. Yeah. Uh, board members, any uh, questions or comments, Vince? Well, first I'd like to congratulate the, the finance team on a clean audit report again this year. So that's always a big deal and it's always important. And so congratulations on that. And then I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and First, I want to say, I love this report. I love the format. There's lots and lots of information. I'll be honest, I did not read this whole document. I mean, I, I may have looked at all the pages, but I did not read it all. There is a lot of information here. And, um, and maybe a professional opportunity for myself, but um, I struggled with how, as a board member, how do I use this document? How do I navigate it? And what is my role in consuming this document? And I am not asking for an answer tonight. And I certainly, I had lots of questions that were coming up as I was going through the document, um, but they're all, you know, little minutia questions, um, probably a little bit out of lane, but I think that this is an opportunity for some development. And it's something that this board has not talked finance and maybe it's because we've been in a pandemic for two years. We just haven't talked finance and school finance very much. And it's just, I see a learning opportunity for this team to come back and talk about nuts and bolts of how we how we fund our, our education. And so I, I just want to maybe, you know, make a note, Sammy, uh, or, you know, you know, maybe next year, you know, can we come back to this document and really think about how do we want, the, how do we ex expect the board to look at this? How would we like the public to look at this document and use it going forward? But it's wonderful. Clearly a lot of work and thought went into it. Um, and I think it's very useful. Lots of really, really good information. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Jody. Vince, just to kind of address the first question you had there. I think uh, for a reader that's unfamiliar with technical uh, financial statements that are included in our audit report, um, the, the first section of the audit report, the transmittal letter, which is from the district um, and the management's discussion and analysis are do a good job of kind of summing up the technical information that's included in the financial statements. Um, and I would note too that we've had a lot of staff turnover this year. And so we are already reviewing the audit report to, and talking about um, making some modifications moving forward because we want it to be a, a, a user-friendly document. We're somewhat restricted in like how it can be modified, um, but we're interested in taking on that work um, in the next uh, coming months. And so, um, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. It is not um, the most, uh, it's it's not something I would expect a school board member to be able to read through and understand really well. And I don't think there's many school board members out there unless they're maybe like CPAs or something that would um, understand a, an annual uh, financial report as such. So yeah, it's clear. Bad. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it was compliance <laughs> language that you just had to have in there and it was pretty clear. But so, yeah, I maybe if we ever any of us get any extra time to think about these things, I would love to collaborate on on how should we navigate a document like this. Thank you, Vince. Other comments or questions?
All right, well, say none, we acknowledge your seat. Next on the agenda, review budget parameters. Uh, and uh, we have parameters for adoption. Is there any, uh, does anyone wish, well, uh, I don't know, Olivia, do you want to give any uh, overview? Uh, we've done this few years back to back and we had really good discussion last year on this. So uh, is there anything you want to add or we're good? No, nothing to add. I just wanted to make it clear in case it wasn't clear. At, at this time, staff isn't proposing any changes to the parameters um, as they were from what they were adopted last year. So just want to be clear, we didn't propose any changes. Wonderful. And for the audience, if someone is uh, watching this, uh, we are starting the process of budgeting by setting the budget parameters. And that's uh, starting the cycle for development of the budget. Uh, and proposing it for the uh, budget committee and then uh, the board's consideration and approval. Uh, Vince? So as I was reading this, uh, one, I was reminded that it's such a really powerful document um, and really does a great job of laying out what a really virtuous budget process would, should look like. And so I just really appreciated the document, but I was reminded um, of former budget committee meetings, listening to members of the budget committee saying, we want community engagement early in the budget cycle. And I'm wondering if that could be put into the budget document. Now I know the district has already surveyed. We, you know, uh, the superintendent discussed uh, results of the engagement with the survey around the option levy, which kind of fits in this space. A lot of the information and priorities of, of the community will surface in that. So I think that we could probably trust that. And goodness knows we probably, we don't have staff time to be doing uh, focus groups right now. We really need to be focusing on having our kids in buildings. Um, but I'm wondering uh, for next year, could we make a mention of that? And I have some draft language here, but something where we're putting public input into the budget process early um, in the fall before we start rolling up uh, expenditures from our buildings upward, um, really just early on to and just giving credence to that and at least saying that we will consider that input in the budget process would be my suggestion. No difference. And I'll go on the wind here and uh, maybe suggest uh, uh, one possibility of uh, community engagement as we if the board approves uh, this uh, uh, document uh, or readopts this document, I would suggest that we could communicate that in our uh, news updates about this meeting, elevate this document as uh, in the summary, and also share that with the budget committee members and uh, uh, in an update with them. And the idea of this, if uh, anyone wants to provide input to the board or the budget committee citizens, they can reach out uh, uh, leaning on those parameters that we have approved and say, here's what we think the parameters mean in terms of uh, budget decisions, which we could uh, receive as a board, as forward for staff as they work on the budget development. Uh, how do we feel about that possibility? So the suggestion is to, uh, at least as a one step now, is to communicate that approval of the budget parameters that link to it. Uh, in our uh, board meeting updates and also uh, to the budget committee uh, members. Yeah, and I'm gonna look at Ken and Ryan, that's something we can do. Yeah, awesome. All right, and I see a virtual thumbs up from you. All right, with that, any further questions, discussion, ideas? I'd like to make a motion. Uh, the, board, uh, the board member states a motion. I move to uh, readopt the 2021 Corvallis School District budget parameters. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, it's been moved uh, to readopt the 2021 Corvallis School District budget parameters and seconded. Uh, I will enter to a vote. Co Vice Chair will be right there. Okay. Director Jones is excused. 
Dr. Tomney? Aye. Aye. Co Vice Chair Tapping McDonald? Aye. Dr. Baker? Aye. Dr. Benzadden? Aye. Chair, I'll jump over with aye. Six to none, passes. All right, we have budget parameters. That's great. May the budgeting season begin. <laughs> On that note, if you are watching it till now, and you are a resident of Corvallis and a registered uh, uh, voter, you are highly encouraged to apply for the vacancy on the budget committee, which includes two to three meetings in April, May, and uh, you'll get to uh, be part of the decision making process uh, for the budget. So please apply, reach out to the school board or uh, to uh, the finance director at the Corvallis School District. Uh, or to learn more about uh, the application process. And I, I believe we're still have the position open, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Next item on the agenda is consolidated action. As a reminder, the items under this portion are of the agenda are for action. Does anyone have a question about anything in consolidated action, which is the minutes for August 12th and August 19 of 2021? See none. Does anyone wish to make a motion? I move to approve consolidated action. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? There seems there's no discussion. It's been moved by uh, co vice chair Sarah Finger McDonald and second by uh, Director Vis Adams uh, to approve consolidated action. On the vote, Director Adams? Aye. Director Baker? All right, we'll come back. Kovach, uh, uh, Sarafin McDonald? Aye. Director Shana Tomini? Aye. Kovach, Chair Lohi Aye. And Dr. Baker, uh, Dr. Therese uh, Jones is excused. And Dr. Tina Baker? Aye. Aye. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six to none passes. You know, he passes with six to none. All right. Next item on the agenda is consolidated information. As a reminder, the items under this portion of the agenda are for discussion. Would anyone would like to discuss an item in consolidated information? Uh, please uh, identify the item and uh, then we will go over them one by one. Uh, Vince? So my list has 10, well, item seven, which is G-B-N-A-A-R. Hazing, harassment, intimidation, menacing, uh, and what else? Item 14, IKFB. Okay. And 15, IKF. Okay. Hello? Um, I didn't write down the item numbers. Do you need those too? Would that be helpful? Uh, you can, uh, it would be helpful, but you can give me the letters and I'll highlight them. Okay, um, does, I can write them down real quick if somebody else has some, or I can just, I'll do them. Okay, it's um, KGBB, which is C1, and we're on that one, right? I'm, yeah, okay. I was like, wait, I got so confused for a second, sorry. Um, and then, because there's a lot of these to scroll down. Um, AC, so C.2, um, GBA, C.4, Vince already said that one, um, basically a bunch of them, um, GB and AB. Could you say that at the last uh, one or two or one more time? Um, it's the... G or G B N A B. 
Perfect. Um, and then um, I G B H A the A R. Um, I'm lost on here. That's C ten. Um, and also C point eleven the I G B I and um, C sixteen I L. That's all. Just a couple. Um, well, I know, uh, I know it has been pulled out, so that's an objection, that's okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. Remember earlier tonight, I, I recognize the fact that you um, know your role and really do a great job with staying with policy. So that's totally fine, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If we, if we do a lot more work on policy and less on operations, everybody will be successful uh, at doing your work. So with that, so any further policy class? Okay, so I'm going to summarize what we have. Actually, no, if, if I skip one, please uh, highlight it. Uh, and we'll start from the top. Um, policy, board policy, so we don't have a, uh, yeah, board policy, AC, non-discrimination, revision, first reading, Luke. What one is this one again? Uh, well, uh, board policy AC non discrimination revision, the first reading, number one. Number one. I'm like, the, I'm trying to scroll up and down. Oh, okay. The, a, the AC, okay. Um, I think we decided we were including gender expression in all of our stuff, correct? Yes. And, uh, we've been the, the gender identity. And so I wanted to make sure that our stuff is consistent. And so that's why I pulled a bunch of them basically. So Melissa, if it's easier for you, me to tell you which ones those are, that may save us some time too. Yeah, that'd be great. And I will just put that a wholesale change on all of those. Okay. So gender expression was missing from AC, uh -huh. um, GBA, GBEA, um, then I G B H A dash A R, and that's actually why I pulled all of those. So um, that was my only comments on those. Fantastic. And I also appreciate the update on um, A C, where that piece was removed about um, on the bottom. I can't remember what the subtext was, but it was like some dated language around um, what sexual orientation means. Yeah, around yeah. sexual orientation. So thanks for that update yeah. too. Um, You're welcome. That's all of those ones. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lou. Uh, next item is. is I have, oh, sorry. So yeah. I was. I mean, this isn't. It sort of follows from AC, mm -hmm. um, but in policy AC in the list of things, it lists perceived and or actual race, and then in other policies that follow that have you know the similar list of. You know, if you identify in identifications that cannot be discriminated against, mm -hmm. it just lists race. Okay. And so I was curious why there's a difference there. And if we feel that if that's appropriate, perceived or actual race should be in all of them. I think it's uh, based on statute. Okay. Yeah. In this case. Okay. So good opportunity for us for advocacy to change that language right. maybe in the long session. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lou, uh, your hands up is for AC. What, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to raise it. I was trying to put it down real quick. All right. All right. Is there anyone who would like to uh, speak to non discrimination board policy AC? All right, see none. The next one is with you, Lou. Uh, or we're stuck with you, uh, Lou, and that's a uh, uh, number three, board policy KGBB, firearms prohibited, a new policy for three. I need to pull that one up real quick. Um, it was um, a question actually um, about firearms under control of law enforcement personnel are permitted. Is that at any time or is that when deemed necessary was my question, or does that matter in this policy? Um, because I know there's um, there's a lot of community feels around this one. 
And I just wanted to make sure like we're saying what we wanted to say, is it because they're an officer, they're allowed to have it? Or is it when um, it's necessary? Or is this like, that's where that, I'm wondering where the wording is, what the wording is intending. I think the, the intent is that it's, you know, when a police officer comes on site, they can have a firearm. But if you're, if you're talking about making it more clear, I don't know, I'm trying to, I, I don't want to like decide what you're thinking, but is, are you saying like a police officer who's, you know, doing their duty on site or something like that in order to make it very particular to when a law enforcement officer can have a weapon? I, I yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering about that because I know that that causes some a lot of fear for certain um, mm -hmm. for certain groups of folk and um, also community like family members or parents that are um, picking kids up and going into buildings when somebody has a firearm on them, um, regardless. Of it, and it could be especially because of being in law enforcement as well, based on their um, experiences and. Um, that was just where that question is based out of, of if it's necessary anytime that an officer goes in the building, because if they're doing a presentation in a classroom, do they need a firearm on them in that instance? Um, and so that's, I'm just curious about that one and wanted yeah. to raise it as a point of concern of some unintended impact of one of our policies. That would, I, I would think that would be something we would want to get some guidance from LFBA around. Um, and in the conversations I've had um, with our police department has been about the uniform and that being a component of that. That's nice. um, so I think that in the, the, um, someone who would be on duty would be um, would be carrying a firearm. Um, and but again, that's something that we could further investigate. Okay. I mean, I would just appreciate that conversation happening a little bit deeper because I want to make sure that folk, I know there are going to be students in the buildings that will be negatively impacted by this, right? And so that's, even if they're going to do a presentation, I mean, I would expect if there was some, an emergency situation, an active shooter or something like that's totally expected, but like an officer doing a presentation in the class or um, coming to check in on things and stuff like that, I think would be, would land differently for students. And um, I know we've had these kind of conversations in the past, so and have heard concern from students. And I wanted to make sure that um, this was brought up because I wouldn't feel okay not bringing it up. Thank you, Lou. So uh, staff will consult uh, yes. uh, with OSBA uh, for uh, feedback on, on, the, on the concerns that uh, they shared. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, Lou or anyone else, any further questions or concerns on KGBB firearms prohibited new first reading? Um, I don't have any concerns. I just am really excited. I mean, I, I agree with Lou. I think, especially if we have an agreement with our local um, law enforcement with how they present themselves in our schools, um, that needs to be able to be reflected in this policy. Um, but I also am just really excited to see this policy finally come in front of us because I know that the work that went into getting this law passed and allowing schools to have some control over um, who could possess firearms on their property. Um, and I also want to just call attention to the second part of that law, which is the safe storage law, which also has a huge impact on kids and families and schools. Um, um, you know, I think it's, it's really the, the most important part of this law. So not really a core concern, just a yay. Statement of support. <laughs> and I have a statement, ditto. Uh, I agree. It's very important that that's a, a policy with uh, this direction. Any uh, further comments? And I will go over the policies just in case uh, a colleague uh, would like to discuss it as well. Uh, GBA equal employment opportunity or written first reading. Uh, Lou, any further comments on it? Which one is this one again? Uh, this is one of those you identified for uh, regarding the gender, uh, the, gender the first, expression. The gender expression. Oh, is this GBA? GBA. GBA. GBA, sorry. Yeah, no. 
Oh, uh, anyone else? All right. Now, GBEA, workplace harassment, so revision for street, blue, or anyone else? That's also a gender expression yeah. addition. Okay. Then, uh, Vince, board policy, GBNA, administrative regulation, hazing, harassment, intimidation, menacing, bullying, cyberbullying, complaint procedures, revision, first reading. Uh, Vince? I think really easy on the second top of the second page. There is the listing of federally recognized categories. It includes sex and including pregnancy. There's a typo. It should say including, not including. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. That's it. Nope. All right. Anyone else? Lou? I have a question about that one too. Is that like federal language where it's in the parentheses, the including part and can't see? That came, that is um, based on a new state statute, state law. And so that's where that came from, from OSBA. Okay, it sounds really bizarre. Like, honestly, <laughs> well, I don't understand like what, what they mean by that. Cause sex is usually like your sex assigned at birth. And like, then it says it's pregnancy. So are they talking about sex in a different way? So I'm like, I'm very confused by that. I don't know if that's feedback to get the, <laughs> OSBA around it, like the intent around it, if it's like, regardless of your, how you're presented in life, if you're pregnant or if it's meaning literally what it looks like it says. So anyways, it just confused me as all. Well. Thanks for clarifying. Any further uh, comments or questions or concerns or uh, thoughts on the policy GBMA administrative regulation? All right, so the next one is uh, board policy GBNAB, JHFE, uh, would be a loop. Suspected abuse of child reporting requirements revision first reading. I just had a question on the that little small um, paragraph that's like three lines long, that's the second paragraph where it says um, that abuse of a child by district employees, contractors, agents, volunteers, or students is prohibited and will not be tolerated. Um, the word prohibited is kind of like, you all know how I am with words. And like, I don't know if that's the right word. Like it's, isn't it unlawful like child abuse? And yes. so I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. Like, would there be a time where it would be not prohibited <laughs> or it would be accepted and tolerated? You know what I mean? So it was kind of like the words that we choose, I think again, are important. And so that was, I just had a question about that. And I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. It, it makes sense, we'll check in, thank you. Thanks, that was the only comment. I wonder if you could substitute unlawful in there. That's what I wrote down, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I was That's what I was thinking. I was like, is it unlawful yeah. or is it, uh, I have that in my notes, prohibited or unlawful, so it was good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further uh, questions or observations? Uh, Anything about the policy? Okay, now we'll transition to the next one. And I believe uh, that was one of those uh, alludes that you addressed already. Board policy, IGPHAARF, evaluation of alternative education program revision first reading. Any additional comments on it? All right, seeing none. Next one is board policy, IGBI, bilingual education revision first reading. Luke? is not cooperating thank you um this is another one it's just a word and it's actually not part of the revised pieces it's just um it's in the second paragraph it says parents who are not able to use english in a manner that allows effective relevant participation the word relevant isn't sitting very well with me because to the parent that probably like their communication is very relevant and so i'm wondering if that word's even necessary if we can just because what you're talking about is just effective or right in, so right. I, I, that was just what I was wondering about that one. Okay. Next item is, oh, sorry, any further discussion uh, on IGBI, bilingual education? Seeing none, Vince, board policy IKFB, graduation exercise, revision first reading, Vince? 
Another easy one down at the bottom of the page, there is a reference to the footnote. So it says, graduating students will be allowed to wear items, cultural significance, honoring their unique and diverse cultures. And then it makes a ref footnote reference, but the footnote is struck out and I didn't understand why or if that was accurate. Yeah, it, that's not accurate. It should be up, up, it should be up next to culture so that it's referencing the footnote. Yep. I was just wondering. And so, yeah, nitpicking, sorry. It's okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Any further discussion or uh, comments on this one? IKFB, graduation exercise, seeing none. Board policy IKF, high school graduation requirements revision first reading. Vince? So, this is a question. So, this the changes in this policy are in response to SB 744, which you know removed essential skills for graduation requirements. Essential skills has been you know, something that the board has really paid a lot of attention to historically. Um, you know, particularly in understanding, uh, getting an understanding of who's going to graduate and who's not, and just trying to understand that. And where this removes that, um, that metric for the, for the board. And I just, I really was curious, you know, about, and really, I guess this question is for you, Ryan, you know, what is the impact on, on graduation? What does this mean uh, for, for students have removing the essential skills and how important really was the essential skills to tracking our graduation? So um, that's been something that we have talked about over time. Um, and one of the things I've appreciated about it has been um, in the years, in past years, the principals of the high schools came together and talked a lot of, and provided a lot of story and narrative about students um, related to graduation. And so to me, that was the valuable, valuable aspect of it in terms of essential skills being a, um, having a significant on graduation. Um, what I've noticed over time in those conversations with our principals has been that that has not been something that has been prohibitive for kids um, in most cases to graduate. Typically, if a student struggles with meeting those essential skills requirements around um, reading, math, and um, writing, that that has impacts on other courses and credits attained. And so I, I still see that it, um, I've, I've heard the narrative or seen the articles that talk about this being something that has um, it, it impacted our diploma, um, making it less important or the criteria, lowering the criteria. And I don't see it that way. Um, because I don't see and I haven't experienced that being the criteria that impacts students um, meeting graduation requirements is typically credits earned. And in those cases, oftentimes um, those skills that are needed to acquire those credits in those content areas are impacted by those um, that skill set. So I don't see it as in any way changing the value of a diploma for a student graduating in Oregon. And so I wanna take that and you went right where I, I was expecting you would and, and what I was looking for. I wanna, can, can I flip it on its head and say, you know, you know, doing work samples to meet essential skills was an important pathway for some students. And I remember stories coming from our principals about, you know, chasing kids down and getting, having them do those work samples so that they could graduate. Does this removing that as a pathway, does that reduce opportunity for kids? Or how are we going to mitigate if that, if there is a loss? Um, I think that those stories were about relationship primarily and working with kids to um, achieve at a high level. And so I think that, um, I don't think that that um, in any way uh, prohibits that or makes that less, ha um, less likely to happen. I still see it happening with our principal day in and day out. It's now it's just um, probably more honed in and focused on those, those, those other aspects of, um, of student life about attendance, about um, passing a class, about turning in an assignment, about, so I mean, those things are still happening and our um, principals are still totally involved in that. It's just, um, 
taking an isolated skill set and practicing it until you achieved it in isolation it, um, and having somebody there to cheer you on is what sort of what's happening with essential skills. We're um, redirecting that towards um, the day to day um, of student life, which is more embedded in those other courses. So it sounds like really we're, you know, kids are just going to have to pass their classes and actually meet requirements, you know, the academic expectations rather than, you know, do these workarounds to, or what that was essentially a workaround to go ahead and graduate. So actually, it, it, it actually makes our graduation. Uh, requirements more rigorous in a way well and clear mm -hmm. thanks for that conversation i appreciate it yeah um i had a comment on the last policy we were on we went too fast so i'm just i have my hand up for that one but i was like there's too many clickings right now um, it's been a rough couple of weeks, but yeah, no when we get, when, whenever we're done with this one. Sounds good. So when, on that note, uh, any further discussions uh, on high school graduation requirements policy? And I just want to just reiterate this one more time. Uh, Vince and Ryan made it very clear. Our expectations of our students to graduate remain the same, 24 credits. Uh, those credits are attained by attaining those skills. Uh, we provide them with an environment that's appropriate and mindful uh, that's uh, helped them succeed and uh, we continue to do that work. So uh, we're very proud of our high uh, graduation rate and uh, I'm really grateful that we're doing this work together. Uh, any further comments or suggestions? See none? Lou, which policy would you like to go for? It was the, um, the graduation exercises. It was actually about the footnote that Vince um, referenced, and I was like, wait, we moved. <laughs> um, I just wanted to highlight that being put into our policies. That's a that's like a very significant historic like inclusion. And um, for folk that don't know, um, it was for a really long time, even illegal, it was like against the law for indigenous people to have be able to wear um, I like things that are culturally significant and things like graduation ceremonies um, to practice culture and even to possess things like eagle feathers. And it wasn't until 1978 that, that, that a federal law was enacted um, called the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. It's what it is, but it's basically to be able to possess eagle feathers and to wear as honor and things like um, graduations from high schools or colleges and other um, ways that those are gifted as um, high achievements, and it's a huge cultural significance. So if you see students wearing eagle feathers in our graduation um, ceremonies, it's a really big deal to not just the student themselves for their identity, but for their families and communities as well. Um, and a lot of work was done to get bills like this passed. And I think it's important for people to understand like why it's really specific on Native American students in particular. And it's really helping heal some of the harm that education has caused in the back in the past and i just wanted to share that about that piece i didn't want us to miss an opportunity to highlight that um i'm really excited that this past um yeah there's been even in oregon students were excluded from participating in their graduation um, exercises um because they wanted to wear eagle feather or wear beads on their cap and stuff like that and so um it's really sad that that happened to them i was um one of the first students to wear eagle feather when I graduated high school in Oregon and um, it was a pretty big deal and it was really a lot of like talking to people and um, advocating and so I'm glad that students don't have to fight so hard to wear a feather on their cap or beads or other um, cultural significant items so thanks for that moment. Thank you. Thank you Lou. Can I just say that um, I'm really excited that you all got to like stretch your muscles with policy this <laughs> this time around because there's more coming. Um, I want to thank you for your patience. I have a new administrative specialist in the office who's learning policy, and we started with some easy ones, and they're gonna they're gonna get a little bit more difficult as we move on to the next round. So thank you. 
um, and we'll have these all cleaned up and ready to go for second week. All right. Well, thank you, and I hope well. Uh, yeah, thank you. We're, we're really yeah. excited to be working with them, and uh, grateful that this board is uh, working diligently on this policy. Thanks. No, I just wanted to express appreciation because uh, the assistant superintendent is working double, triple duty. You, uh, we heard earlier about all the operational things that she is managing and had the time to pull these policies together and bring them to us. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing. You're working really hard. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Any any uh, discussion? Any points of the for information policies or for information points? All right. Seeing none. Board member comments. And I would like to start. Um, I have a comment I want to share with the board in a future uh, agenda item. Uh, in con consultation with uh, co-vice chair Sarah McDonald and Lovely White Bear, uh, I'll be calling for the board to choose its next chair and uh, the next meeting, February 3rd, uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, it's been an honor, truly an honor of my life to serve as a board member and the chair, and uh, for you to trust me on this uh, for three consecutive years. Uh, we have done in these three years phenomenal work that probably hasn't been accomplished for decades on economic prosperity for students who could have been dropouts rather than graduates. Uh, with and that they have dreams that they can accomplish on health and wellness of students who are safer because of our work on commitments for universal justice uh, for our schools, our staff, and our community. Uh, if this board meeting was an example of the good work we do on policy, on health care, on education, on infrastructure, uh, this is a role model of how education should be. And I'm just honored to uh, be in the seat to watch this happen and and to have this gavel uh, where we can accomplish all of this work. But it's time for me to pass the gavel as I pursue uh, another uh, as I pursue a higher office. Uh, though uh, I am kind of contemplating very hard on uh, serving on the board while pursuing that office, I believe I could, but uh, I will be thinking seriously if I should step down from my service as a board member as well. Uh, I'll be thinking about that seriously. Uh, and I believe I could uh, perform those duties uh, to the best of my ability while uh, I pursue uh, my higher office, but until that can appear at least. However, uh, it's really important and we are very fortunate. It's really important to have leadership that can be focused and that can speak on behalf of the board uh, freely without even the uh, distraction of any election. And uh, as the only, in my understanding, as the only board that has two co-vice chairs who are ready to hit the road running from day one, uh, I'm very confident that the board will choose leadership uh, that will continue this work and uh, that will continue the support for its superintendent and staff and community. Uh, so with gratitude, uh, I'm really grateful, and I just want to share that with you as we are uh, headed toward uh, February 3rd meeting, where we will be calling for an election of officers for the board to choose its next chair. And with that note, I want to really thank uh, Brian as a partner and a leader uh, who have made uh, really the, this job uh, easy uh, and really fulfilling. Uh, so it's been an honor to uh, serve in that capacity. With gratitude. Well, and I've appreciated it too. We've spent many an hour um, together mm -hmm. talking, planning, um, responding. So uh, thank you for your um, ongoing support and uh, friendship. Thank you, Ryan. Likewise, Vince. Well, I would just first like to express, you know, deep appreciation, Sammy, for your leadership, uh, for you know. You know, starting and being my vice chair when I when I was leading this board and then stepping into that role and accelerating the work that that we started together, and so I'm just really excited for you as you're you know can you know campaigning and moving on, and I would just like to make a request. You know, as I'm thinking about your transition, I know that continuity is very important for children. This is a very delicate time for. Um, not just our district, all districts in Oregon and across the country. And so I'm very, 
I want to be cautious, and I know that the demands of the campaign trail are are great. But if if at all possible, and you are able to remain on the board, um, I would very much appreciate it, and I think it would uh, benefit our board to have you there. I'm sure that you know we have people that are prepared to take leadership roles. Um, and so I think that we can make accommodations and ensure that uh, we can help you serve us while you're preparing to serve uh, uh, the greater good. So I would really ho hope that you can stay with us for just a little bit longer. That'll be my best. Any further comments? Uh, Shauna Delu. Thanks, Sammy, and wishing you all the best on, on your next endeavors. And I second what Vince shares as well. Of course, you'll have to make choices that work best for you, but continuity would be wonderful as long as possible. But of course, we understand as you're making decisions. Um, since we didn't have board report outs, I did have just a really brief report. I was able to attend the Franklin PTA meeting this week, which was really wonderful to see. I so I just want to give a, a shout out to other PTAs and PTOs in the district. Please continue to send invitations to us to attend those meetings. I'm trying to attend as often as I can. I know other board members are interested in as well, but it was such a wonderful opportunity to connect with families, staff, and to hear about the work that's happening really in partnership between those groups of family, staff, and also hearing about opportunities where they're engaging students in different opportunities to apply for funding and thinking about that as a learning opportunity through those PTAs, coordinating volunteers for the schools, looking at how they're really coordinating events to show gratitude for educators and staff along the way. So I really just enjoyed the time meeting, meeting the families and the staff that were participating this week. A couple of things that came up, one that I've heard at each PTA meeting or PTO meeting that I've been to so far was the question of what are other PTAs doing? Or what are other PTOs doing? Because we wanna know how are they raising funds? How do they work with their schools? What are they doing for staff? Um, so I've heard that question come up a couple of times. And at this particular meeting, the question went a little bit deeper and further where a parent actually asked and said, you know, is there a role that the district can play or the school board in finding a forum to help connect us in some sense? So I just wanted to put, down, put that down as a, a thought that's coming up and then I'm hearing repeated. So it seems like there's interest from those groups and maybe something that we could think about how that might come out. And then one other question that came up that I'll just place for the uh, district leadership was a question about the youth truth data and, and real appreciation for seeing that data come out this year and really looking at student experience. And also just the question of, is that data that, that's been shared in snapshots so far in the school board meetings, something that'll be shared more broadly, both with school communities around what are students at their own school saying, as well as made public on either on one of the school sites in terms of how data is portrayed in other years, just to see across the district, where are things working really well for students, as well as are there lessons learned from certain schools that could be carried on? So there was a just a question about that and and real interest and appreciation for that attention. So thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, one of the things I would say is that um, in the past, uh, Lee from the foundation has brought together PTA leaders. Um, I know that she did one um, in the fall, but that, that's a great uh, it, that's a great thing that you're hearing. So that's something we can do some more communicating out about. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, Ryan. Lou? Yeah, um, just real quick, I want to say thanks, Sammy, even though we'll probably say that again next week for your leadership. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll talk about this again at the next meeting. Um, but I did want to just... Um, kind of encourage the community as the COVID numbers um, start to come out for the district. If it looks alarming, <laughs> just remember we're in a certain, I don't know what the numbers look like. I'm just assuming they're going to be higher than they normally have been just based on my experience yes. seeing numbers at OSU way higher than they normally are. <laughs> um, and so I don't see how this would be an exception. And just to remember that everybody's doing, well, mostly everybody's doing the best they can to um, take as many precautions as possible. And 
we just need to continue to do that and to not lose hope when you see high numbers, especially in our local community. Um, and as more and more of our friends and family members are impacted, um, we just got to stick with it and not drop our um, drop the precautions we're taking and the measures we're taking. And I just really wanted to offer that um, as those, as those numbers continue to be released, especially because the peak's supposed to be over the weekend. And so we'll probably see alarming numbers over the next week as well. Um, so I just want to throw that out there and don't forget to um, think about your mask choices too <laughs> and your vaccine choices. Thank you, Lou. And uh, I would just echo that and say uh, dropping our guard today uh, would be like dropping our guard for the last uh, 200 days. So, and I'm throwing that number arbitrarily but it's truly something of that magnitude because we're going into a surge. So definitely we need to uh, be more uh, careful right now. Thank you, Luke. really appreciate that. Sarah? Yeah, um, I want to also express my appreciation for your leadership and your role on the board. Um, it's been great working with you and I think we get to continue to work together. Um, a few other things on my, on my list. One is I, at one point when I was involved in Garfield PTA, participated in that Corvallis Public Schools Foundation leadership group, and it was a great opportunity. Um, and so I really, you know, I, and now as the liaison to the foundation, uh, I can talk to Leaf about it some more, but what was really fabulous about it was the, the different parents from different schools learned a lot from each other. I learned both you know, things that other schools were doing that they could do. And they also learned a little bit about the challenges at other schools that they may not see. And so I think it was a really great community building group because it gave a broader understanding across our schools and what all of you know, what's going on at each school. So um, I would hope that that can continue for, for our PTA leaders and PTA grants. And it wasn't exclusively the PTA officers who participated. Um, the other thing is I um, had a long conversation with the head of um, SEAC, which is our, um, our group for, for families with children um, with disability in our schools. And it was a really good conversation and it you had me thinking about equity. And as we talk about equity, who we're talking about, and as we're talking about data and disaggregating data, you know, and we look at things like graduation rates and you know, students with disabilities having lower graduation rates, how we look at that data and, and where there might be intersections of identities that are impacting some of our students differently than others. Um, but it was, you know, I think as we, we, we talk about equity a lot, which is fabulous, um, but we need to make sure we're not missing a group that also needs to be, be brought to the center of that. Um, following up on what Lou said, there are several vaccine clinics going on or coming up. I don't have the dates off the top of my head. Ryan, I do. Ryan knows them, so he will share them. But yeah, so vaccination, get vaccinated. So tomorrow um, at Sheldon from three to seven. Um, and then the second one at Sheldon is February 4th, which is the follow up. And those are for kids five to 17. And they have boosters too. At this one, the only, Pfizer is the only uh, okay. Pfizer's the only one. The only one available at this, this event. And yeah. how to sign up or drop it off. Okay. Drop it, yep. No schedule. So I'm glad you brought that up because I had it written down and I didn't <laughs> include it in my report. Oh. Yeah, so masks and vaccines. That, that's it. Right, any further comments? Well, thanks to you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. And uh, I love this work, so I'll do my best and I will continue on this board as much as it takes uh, because I love it. I really love it and I enjoy it. And I couldn't uh, think of a, a better uh, leader than uh, uh, Sarah's uh, service and work and 
I, I've been a better person because of her uh, feedback and advice and and uh, and, and uh, I'm sure the board uh, will be in really good shape because uh, uh, this is a really good seat. So really, I want to thank you all for your kind words and uh, looking forward to continue this important work uh, here and everywhere. All right, with that, any further comments? Seeing none, the school board meeting is adjourned.